Thank you very much for the, for the introduction of the panel. Um, as we heard this morning, uh, AD is not about technology, as Tony said. Technology doesn't save life. Um, I haven't heard of any AD who saved a life by its own. So it needs people there, and it needs a system, and it needs a system to get people there to use the AD, and it needs a culture to do so. So there's a lot about this, which is not technology, but which is more important, which is human and, and, and systems to be set up among, among, uh, in the communities. And it is, that is what we're gonna discuss. We know that AD do save lives if they are used by humans in the right situation. So, so this is the, so this is the uh, thing that we will skip in this session. Uh, for this panel, uh, I think it would be nice. Welcome, YY. You can bring your tea if you want to. <laughs> no, it's fine. Uh, so I think what we, would be nice is we have four different experts, three from Australia and one from Singapore, uh, to just give a few words on, on their system, what's it, just what, what are they working with, where, where is it located, how does it work, just shortly. Um, please, yeah. Uh, hi, I'm from Northern Territory. Um, I'm actually a Kiwi, if you can't tell by the accent, but um, living up in, um, in Darwin in Northern Territory, St. John. We, um, we have an interesting environment because we have, if you look at the statistics of the size and the population, we actually have 5.6 hectares each to play around in in the Northern Territory, and I think that's the only territory or state in the country that has that much of our own land we can play with. Um, so we have a lot of land and not too many people, but that provides all sorts of different problems. Um, we also have a very high indigenous population, so um, about 60% of our patient um, load is indigenous. Um, and with all of that, the cultural awareness stuff comes um, because they don't, um, they don't believe in touching people who they think are dead or are dead. Um, they have quite a lot of taboo about that. They, they call it sorry business and it's, um, they do their own thing with it. Um, and so getting them into um, helping us with CPR and, and AEDs is quite um, challenging to say the least. Um, we are, so, so that's probably our biggest problem is getting, you know, our bystander CPR rates are very low compared to everywhere else in the country. And so that's one challenge, but also getting them to use an AED because they also still don't want to touch the patient. Um, and they have a very high um, sickness, illness load as well. So, you know, they're chronically ill. So when they do collapse and, and have a cardiac arrest, um, especially with renal disease, you know, it's, it's quite often would respond to a... Um, AED if there was one around. We are running a program that, and we've had a grant from the um, NT government and NT Health to help put um, AEDs into communities. Now, for those of you who haven't been into the NT, a community is actually, uh, for those of you that are Kiwis, it's like a marae, but it's, uh, it's, out, it's not a town, it's a group of houses, loosely called houses, um, of people that live together on their own land, on country, and they, uh, it's a private place, it's not, um, it's not like a town with services and things like that. They occasionally have health clinics there, they may have a school, they may have nothing, um, but just a group of houses that live together. So, and they're well out, the dirt roads, um, you know, 300, 400k from anywhere remotely looking like it would have a clinic. So having AEDs and things out there is most important um, to try and get that ROSC, if, you know, before, because the first responders could be us, could be police, could be road, uh, could be choppers. Um, so we're trying to input that out. So we started a program this year whereby we've put 75 um, AEDs out into the communities um, and they've gone not too remote just yet, but they've gone two to 300 k's away from a, from a centre. Um, and, and we've taken the initiative of doing some CPR with them while they're there, but it's not the criteria because we, d we want them to use the AED. Um, as opposed to, you know, if they don't want to do CPR on the patient, then we want them to at least use the AED. So we do CPR um, demonstrations out there and, and kind of show them how to do it and, and concentrate on the, on the younger and on the kids um, rather than on the adults. Um, so that's probably our chief. The other thing that we do have... You can tell me to be quiet any time you like. The, um, <laughs> the other thing that we do do that's different to everybody else is... Um, all of our cardiac arrests, we have the police go to. We don't use fire, like a, um, so like a lot of others, we don't use a lot of. So we have a dual response with 
with the police. So we always have um, one police responder, which is so two of them, and they also mostly have AEDs in their cars, um, or their utes really, and their general duties utes. So, um, and they're very good at doing CPR. They're also most proficient at putting on an AED. Um, and, and so that for us is something different that works, that works quite well. Um, it's just that they're in the same position we are. They're not always where the, the cardiac arrest is. So, but at least it gives us another option for getting bystander CPR and AEDs to the scene when we're not there. Thank you. It, it was just meant to be a short introduction. <laughs> but in, 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 yeah. Yeah, but it was so interesting. A lot of questions rises. So uh, what we do is a short introduction, and then, then we will get into questions from you on the different systems and how, they, how it worked and how it, why it didn't work, and like the police co-responders, how did you get them engaged, and, and how do you convince people that it, AD actually works uh, if it's not just sorry situations, as you said. Please. Uh, I was born in a small town in the northwest. <laughs> <laughs> just joking. <laughs> Just joking. Uh, in this panel today, I'm going to be talking about Ambulance Victoria and our connection with um, our EMR co-responders. Uh, so we do co-respond to cardiac arrest in cases of ca uh, suspected cardiac arrest with the Fire Brigade. Um, that program began in 2001 with the MFB, or Metropolitan Fire Brigade, and uh, sh soon after became uh, business as usual for the, the Fire Brigade, and it was incorporated into all um, uh, MFB fire stations, and there's about 50 of those. Uh, across the metropolitan region of, of uh, Victoria. Uh, and in around 2008, we ex the, expanded that program to include the Country Fire Authority, or CFA. Um, and since then, up until uh, last year, that's been expanding across all um, professional uh, stations with the CFA, where we have um, full-time and, and career staff um, in that fire department, and they're all on board with the EMR as well. Um, and I guess uh, our challenges are that they're two independent uh, organisations, each separate from Ambulance Victoria, so each has their own sort of governance and funding and competing interests and, um, uh, so th and their own sort of medical advisors. And, and so there's always a, a bit of a pull and a, a push and a pull to try and get... Uh, we're all heading in the same direction, but we want to make sure that we're working together um, to head in that same direction and not, not, um, uh, not competing or making it more difficult than it has to be. Um, I guess uh, where we'd like to end up is to have that program expand even further um, throughout our other country uh, fire authority um, uh, stations that includes volunteers as well, which would be a really big challenge um, because it's uh, uh, the response to get people to sort of give up their, uh, to drop, the, drop what they're, they're doing with their, their day jobs or wherever they are, um, head to the station, grab the gear, head out to the cardiac arrest um, where you think, oh, surely that can't be worth it. But in some of those out, uh, far outreaching regional areas of Victoria, it's, it has the potential to make a really huge difference um, because the ambulance response time is, is quite protracted out in those regions as well. So that's where we want to be heading. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Hey, I'm, my name's Mick. Uh, I work for SA Ambulance. I'm at Intensive Care Paramedic, and my job is to, as a regional team leader for Kangaroo Island. Um, so just to put that into context, those of you that don't know where Kangaroo Island is, it's about 12 k's off the coast of South Australia, about 75 k's directly from Adelaide. Um, and in terms of size, just uh, in relation to some of our earlier discussions, um, we're six times the size of Singapore. So a little bit, yeah, a little bit bigger than people think, but we're only a tenth the size of Denmark. So, um, so uh, our. Our um, AED um, program really relates around community CPR. So we've got a real focus on bystander CPR. Um, and so, uh, and that really relates to the fact that on, on the island, I really am the, the only uh, career emergency service worker and all the other emergency services are staffed by volunteers. So um, like we just discussed here at the end of the day, those guys aren't sitting in their ambulance stations or in their fire trucks waiting for the call. They're at home, they're at work, they're carrying pages, the pager goes off, they, they finish what they're doing, they come in and they, and they respond to the job. So inherently our response times are much longer. Um, and what we find um, from an emergency service perspective is the vast majority of arrests that we come to are non-shockable rhythms by the time we get there. Um, so really, um, we on the island have had a huge focus and there's a group of us that are doing it, there's myself, 
one of the local GPs, Dr Tim Lewenberg, and his wife, who also volunteers for us, Trish Lewenberg. And we've put a lot of time and effort into trying to engage the community in community CPR because it really is, and our message is really simple, it's your only chance of surviving at our hospital cardiac arrest is for the person next to you to start CPR when, when it happens. So we put a huge amount of time and effort into training people to do that. Um, and um, also what we have done um, is with AEDs, we have a, an AED program and again, we like to keep things nice and simple. Um, we, we noticed that within the community, there are lots of different organisations, pubs, hotels, sporting groups that have had AEDs donated or able to, to acquire them through, through various processes, but they sort of get the device and then it sits there and no one knows what to do with it. So what we did was we hunted them all down. Um, we found them where they were across the island. Um, we put them on a, on a registry that we manage ourselves and um, we just gather details like expiry dates for pads, batteries, etc., things, and help those community groups manage the device. Um, we also then provide training to them on their device. So we go around to their sports clubs, their businesses and whatever, and we deliver training to them to show them how to use their device. Um, and uh, we also then sat around and looked at a map of Kangaroo Island. Um, and so we have a population of about four and a half thousand people and most of that is, is, is located inside towns. We had a look at the map um, and we, I, we sort of, we have also hundreds of thousands of tourists who visit the island. And the, the most beautiful parts of the island are the most remote parts. Um, and so we have a big risk for, for us that sit out there. So we sat down and we looked at the map and we said, where, where sh should there be an AD where there isn't one? After we identified all the ones that were there. And then we as a group sat down and engaged um, local businesses, um, government agencies, um, and also uh, local charities and um, identified how they might be able to provide AEDs to those areas. So um, we started with about six or seven AEDs um, and only one of them was public access. And um, by the end of that process, we now have, there's 50 AEDs across the island, 38 of them are public access to fibrillation 24 seven. So it was a pretty successful result um, for a small community. Thank you. And why, why Singapore is something quite different, but maybe if you could, put, and you already talked about some of it, but maybe you could put it into perspective of having heard this from Australia. Yep, okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, um, I'm YY or Ying. Um, my name has one vowel. Um, I always ask my parents about that. They, they claim that it's not a mistake. <laughs> but if you Google it, I think it's the only, YY, uh, only Ying in the world. So. Uh, my perspective on AEDs is that the traditional model of public access defibrillation really only works in very urban city centres where there's a large uh, volume of people near the devices, you know, that, and that's, I think that model works really in a highly urbanised place. So uh, fixed location AEDs work great in Singapore, even in residential areas, because we're packed like sardines, right? So one block, uh, 500 people living in the air, and there are AEDs on the bottom of the place. So that has worked very well for a place like Singapore. I see you know, a very opposite problem with uh, Australia where you know, the population density, you know what it is. I mean, it's a lot uh, lower than us. And I think that perhaps some solutions that might uh, potentially serve in, in a place like Australia would really be one where the AD moves to you. you know? Because the idea of planting uh, AD every 300 meters uh, in the outback, right, is crazy, right? It's just not going to be cost effective. Um, we, we've been experimenting with various models, uh, like uh, with, with a taxi AD program. So taxi drivers who are circulating around the city, uh, we've put 100 ADs in the taxis. We give them the My Responder app, and uh, we gave them a two kilometer driving radius so that they could actually get an alert if the cardiac arrest was within two kilometers. So we are expecting like a 30, 40 km driving speed. We tell them they're not supposed to speed and then they would drive the taxi with the AED to assist in a cardiac arrest case. So we are looking to use that as a means of covering areas that we couldn't plant the AEDs, like the residential areas or uh, areas where you, know, you couldn't plant a fixed uh, AED location device. Um, other things we've tried uh, and we're still trying is that we are actually doing autonomous uh, AED drones as well. 
So we have AEDs that can fly, and our problem is that Singapore is so urban, and uh, Changi Airport is literally right next to uh, residential commercial areas. So there are a lot of uh, flight path restrictions for drones, but I see that as less of a problem in Australia. And a flying drone at about 80 to 100 kilometers per hour can probably cover a fair uh, number of people in the community uh, if you needed that as, uh, you know, to get an AD to you, uh, you know, and provides a wide coverage. So the technologies are maturing, and I think autonomous flight is actually uh, getting easier. You know, you pair it with an app, you press the thing, the, the drone flies. But of course, the business case is always challenging. The thing is, uh, maintaining this as a service by itself is really hard. So we've been actually looking at ways that we could partner or uh, organizations that already perhaps have drones. So we actually thought if, you know, like Amazon was flying drones in Singapore, you could actually tag on a, a you know, an Amazon box drone, uh, instead carry an AED where we needed that uh, as an additional service, because for them it's incremental cost. You know, and perhaps logistics companies or taxi companies in Australia might be interested. You know, you're, you have delivery vans of DHL or other logistics company that are actually circulating all around the island delivering uh, all the time. So perhaps these guys may be potential uh, responders to deliver AEDs as well if you really needed something. But of course, this would be a, a strategic collaboration that needs to be discussed through. But I think as all the speakers pointed out, culture change is probably your hardest thing, right? You bring an AED, but the guy says, I don't know what to do with this. So I think this whole thing about training community and training people to activate the devices and recognize cardiac arrest and uh, be, um, you know, comfortable enough to use the device is uh, important. Um, my last point, um, I, uh, Singapore, we started, I mean, uh, we started doing this whole residential AD program. Uh, it was really a program. So actually, the devices, we don't buy the AEDs actually. So it's kind of like defibrillation as a service. You know, you have like ride sharing as a service, software as a service. We, we do defibrillation as a service, so to speak. So when we tendered out the thing as an open contract, uh, we basically lease the devices. It's costing about $200 uh, a year per device. And everything on the back end is taken care of. So like if you fire off an AD, right? Uh, Zoll, which is the one who won the contract, they come in within four hours, replaces the pads, the batteries, downloads data, brings it back to me, or rather to uh, our registry people, and it's really hands-free. So I don't have any of my staff having to deal with this because the whole thing is an end-to-end service and uh, for a flat fee. So, I mean, we predict that, let's say, 5 to 10% of the ADs will get fired off, and we kind of pay this extra price for the pads and the batteries up front. So it's kind of seamless compared to the old model where you buy the devices and four years later, suddenly you're buying like uh, 5,000 batteries at a shop, you know? Or unpredictably, you don't know when you have to buy new pads and replace batteries every time something gets fired. So something to think about, defibrillation as a service. Maybe that might be a useful concept if you are buying ADs on a large scale. That's a good business model, but we are not in financial business. We are in saving lives. <laughs> but it's really good uh, to, to try that on. Uh, I, have a, I just want to follow up on, on what you said, YY, and, and what you also said. So, uh, and that would be, how do you activate your ADs and the bystanders in your community? And I have a long list of questions here. Uh, and we can either play the game, guess my questions, uh, <laughs> or you can come up with the questions yourself. So after this, my first question, it's up to you. We have two microphones here, so just come and ask questions. Challenge these uh, expert uh, opinions and also come and give some advice on how we can improve AD programs. In Japan, they have a lot of ADs per population. We have the same in Denmark. We experienced that we, we thought that putting more ADs out there would uh, save more lives. It didn't uh, because it wasn't activated. So how do you make sure that the ADs you have in your community is activated or how could you make sure that it is activated in case of cardiac arrest? Any suggestions from any of you? Um, so we, SAS has a registry. Um, so all our devices are registered um, through SACAD. So at the time of the call, once they work out the location, the call taker will get information. I'm not exactly sure of the science, but the call taker will get information to be able to inform the caller where their closest AED is. 
Um, and the other thing that we've done is obviously, it's about, like I said, um, we like to think the community owns the program and not us, and it's their program. So it's about increasing their awareness. So when, whenever we train groups, we let them know where there is, where there's AD is, but also where all the other ones are on the island. Um, and so there's an awareness within the community where the devices are. And so the activations of the devices we've had thus far have been without any advice. It's just been a local member or a community member knows where the closest device to them is and has gone and got it and used it. So that's, that's worked successfully for us, but we are a small, closed community. So. Yeah, so they're supposed to know the AEDs there in their uh, vicinity, uh, where they're living and where the categories occur, if they remember, otherwise they'll be uh, reminded by the dispatcher. Yeah. Uh, so they have that in their, si in their system, yeah. Uh, yeah. and then we'll guide them to the AD there yeah. in the local community. So it's got a description of where the device yeah. is located. So, yeah. They get that information by phone. Yes, right. when call yeah. triple O and our call taker gets that information come up on their screen and they're able to give that information to the caller as to where the lo nearest AED is located. And then they leave the victim. Then they'll, it's the same as anyone, isn't it? So they're there, they'll start CPR and then they'll arrange to get the AED there. We, we focus, because of the distances, we do focus on CPR. And that's an issue that we have with AEDs where people will use an AED and they think, you know, the terminology is like heart start and things like that, where they go, you know, I'm going to put the AED in and that's going to save the patient. And we try to make the focus about good CPR and, and talk about saving, you know, the difference between you and me is, is, is my brain. You know, that's what makes me, me and you, you. Um, and so we want you to save the brain. So we focus on them get doing really good, high quality CPR and then as soon as possible, go and get the AED. Thank you. Other comments on how to activate the AEDs? Uh, Ambulance Victoria maintains a, an AED registry as well. Um, uh, but with the rollout of Good Sam, we've, we've rolled out early last year and just recently expanded to community responders. Uh, where I've seen that on Twitter. You've seen it on Twitter? <laughs> so, so you've looked at it in the, uh, for more than five seconds in the last uh, th three months. Um, as part of our expansion of Good Sam to the community, where we're increasing our registration uh, with AEDs and, and, and working on integrating the, the Good Sam technology into our um, dispatch, uh, where, whereas we can uh, have a closer connection with Good Sam responders and hopefully, if they're on their way to a case, uh, have them go by the closest AED and pick it up, which I, I, don't, I don't believe we have um, that, that technology at the moment. It's sort of more reliant on if someone's uh, just happens to have a cardiac arrest in a building where an AED is, is located. Um, so being connected with smart technology and, and taking advantage of that and working on integrating that into our existing processes will help to um, increase the amount of bystanders uh, collecting an AED on the way to a case and, and hopefully providing an early defibrillation um, prior to EMS arrival. So usually you could Sam uh, use responders who are professional uh, signed up, but uh, you changed that, didn't you? Yeah, I don't mean to um, take away from a talk that's coming up, but we've recently expanded our, our model for our uh, Good Sam, whereas it started with uh, Ambulance Victoria responders and then it expanded to health professionals uh, within Victoria. And then uh, since July, I believe, we've expanded to community responders with a, a CPR certificate. Mm. Um, and with the potential to, you know, starting with just Ambulance Victoria employees, a couple of thousand expanding to all upper registered employees, a couple thousand more um, with the community, the potential for um, millions, you know. So that was an appetizer for the next talk, yeah. Mm. yeah. An appetizer. Yeah. And Sue, please. Yeah, we have a slightly different view on this. We don't um, try to activate the AED, we try to activate the people. Um, and, you know, so for our AEDs and communities, the ones that we've actually put out in the last eight or nine months, we, they go to a person, not to a building. Um, and it's all organised with the, usually the local land care or um, council, that type of stuff. So the AED itself out in the community will be the responsibility of a person and they can, you know, they, so they know where it is. So 
Um, hopefully, you know, generally with a lot of these places, there's not a lot of connect connectivity in terms of um, phones and things either. So um, their phones tend to be in the same place, usually schoolhouses or something like that. So then that's where the, we want the AED. So we concentrate on the person rather than the AED. Thank you. Uh, questions for the panel, please? Yes? There's a question. Microphone is coming. Um, I'd like to ask a question uh, that relates to availability of uh, AEDs. Um, probably relates more and more to the uh, urban environment, so Wai Wai and uh, Matt. Um, so we have a registry um, in, in Wellington, in fact nationally, we have a registry in New Zealand uh, of AEDs. Um, and I think both ambulance services um, uh, sell AEDs uh, you know, on request, they make them available on the market. Uh, and built into the registry and the control by the relevant ambulance service, uh, there is servicing of the AED when it's used. There's download uh, of the, uh, the rhythm strip. Um, cardiologists normally need that, uh, particularly in younger people. If they're thinking of putting in an ICD, uh, they want to know absolutely that it was shockable rhythm and, and, and look at the rhythm itself. Um, so that side, I think, is, is pretty well organized. But the, the problem area um, are independent companies uh, one in particular, uh, who will sell on the open market AEDs to people who've heard their good ideas and uh, we ought to have one, we ought to have one in our office. Uh, and, and when that happens, there's no guarantee that that AED will be registered. There's no guarantee it will be serviced. Often the ambulance service is asked to go and look at a, an AED that they've had no exposure to previously. They find the batteries are flat uh, and the pads needed changing months or more ago. Um, have you encountered that situation? And, and, and if so, how do you deal with it, please? I'll just okay. check one of my questions. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> OK, so um, uh, I think you, you, you hit the problem on the nail. Um, well, we actually had the same problem. And I think, uh, I'm not sure, did I share this uh, during this talk where we had a 12% um, failed AADs or AADs that had issues? when we first started registering, we actually used a community partner, so it's an NGO called the Singapore Heart Foundation. So what happened was that government wanted uh, this whole uh, you know, community CPR AED to remain as community rather than government solving the problem for you. So we actually worked with an NGO to do the, the registry as a community registry. So it's not actually legislated. So uh, the community partner actually hires two people that would go around to check uh, all the AEDs uh, every year. So the first time around we registered all the AEDs, they would give them a sticker with the serial numbers, with the expiry uh, dates of the pads, batteries and servicing. So this is centrally registered uh, one time. So once we do that, every year we actually go back and uh, when we see that the pads, batteries are going to be expired, we would, uh, you know, they would email them, they give them a call, and then they will try and uh, make a visit to remind them that they need to update the batteries, the pads, uh, you know, and then get the servicing going. Because in Singapore, strangely, as much as we legislate things, somehow the ADs are not very well legislated. So it's not compulsory to have annual servicing there. So, so long as the vendors, uh, provide the well uh, have the ability to service, but uh, there's no requirement to service. So this made us um, uh, work with the NGOs to do this by moral suasion, and so far it's worked fairly well. We don't see well now my my failure rates are less than a percent, so it's like 0.7 percent uh, right now after about three four years of uh, doing this project, and I think building owners are also starting to get it. We realize often they are not willful in this, but it's really that when someone buys the AED, uh, two years later, the facility service manager changes. He's got a new job, he moved to a new place, a new guy comes in and says, I don't know what this is, I didn't buy this, I'm not sure what's it for, and I don't know who to contact to fix this. So when we have someone go down and explain to him, we give him a booklet on best practices, we explain to him what he needs to do for his AED and what happens if it fires off, uh, then uh, they get on board with the program. So there's a lot of retraining, there's a lot of re-education every time they switch uh, these uh, fires, uh, fire and facility service managers. So I, I, I don't know if that's helpful uh, for your context. Other comments to that? Short comments, please. Yeah, in, in Victoria we have um, uh, AEDs that are uh, 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 
you, the public can buy off the shelf. Um, so we have uh, many, many AEDs around that are, are no doubt not registered within our Ambulance Victoria registry. Um, and that the number is increasing as well as, as uh, laws change and there's, there's different organisations recommending that workplaces have AEDs and things like that. And so people are independently going out and purchasing them as they become more portable and, and cheaper. Um, the ones that aren't in our registry, there's a lot of value lost because the, the things we spoke about before um, and there's a lot that can be gained from having it in our registry, for example, collecting the data and being able to maintain it and know that it's there and have a responder uh, collect it and, and use it, um, which is a lot more valuable than having it sitting in the corner with no one knowing about it. Um, some of the challenges are uh, that they're just private organisations selling these uh, devices and they, it, their motivation is to sell the device. Um, and so it w it's an extra little burden for us to, um, uh, to attach to that the task of then saying, oh yeah, here it is, but we want you to contact Ambulance Victoria and get it registered and follow these guidelines, etc. So our organisation is in the process of developing a, um, a, a very brief sort of guideline on, on best, rec best practice and, and recommendations for having your, your AED. Um, and also, we just in a brief discussion, we re really liked what Huawei is doing in, in Singapore by, by putting on that sticker on the front of it, talking about when your pads expire, when your battery expires, when it's due for a, a checkup, just like on your car. Um, and I guess we're going to be approaching first aid providers, uh, first aid certificate providers, and, and education um, organisations, and get, encouraging them to. to say to everybody, if you do purchase an AED, try and get it signed up to the Ambulance Victoria Registry and give them the incentives to do that and, and, and say what the, the value in that is and that, that hopefully will um, be the tipping point to get people to do that extra little activity on top of purchasing it and claiming it on tax. Thank you. Why, why? Just a very quick point, sorry. Just uh, another quick point, right? Does the Good Sam have a AED fault reporting button uh, in the Good Sam, so that if you have the app, you could just take a picture of the faulty AD and you could tell the registry. So that's something that we have on the My Responder app. Uh, the other thing that we do with the Singapore Heart Foundation is that we tell people who are registered, uh, if your AD is registered and it gets fired off, right, you can go back to the foundation and get a $50 discount off your replacement pads and batteries, provided you fill up details of the cardiac arrest. So it gives us another lead to collecting data about public access defibrillation. So the facility manager has to fill up as much as he can about what happened and the ambulance service may not have access to that data because you come in, you go out in 10 minutes or 15 minutes, there's still a lot of information that you don't get. So we, we encourage the owners because they say, hey, I'm going to get free pads or nearly free pads and batteries. Uh, and a check, you know, and I just need to fill up this form for data and submit it back. So we also use this as a way to reel in more data uh, back to the registry. So maybe that might be helpful. It's again, creating an incentive to make them t take that next step. Purchasing the device is the first step. The next one is the incentive. How, how do we get them to sign up? What we've done, part of the problem with maintaining devices is people don't realise the ongoing expenses. And for small community groups, it's a lot. Um, um, so what we've managed to do, we, we keep a register similar, it's just a spreadsheet um, that has all the expiry dates, we've got contacts, we, we would monitor it and email them and say your devices, they're out of date. But what we also do is we've tried to make as many of the devices on the island as similar as we can. We've got a simple device that we know works. So then we'll have, we'll have a list, it'll say there's 10 pads that are coming up in the next six months in these community groups that are due for replacement. So then we will get a cost for that and then we'll go and approach other community organisations like uh, Lions, CWA and, and community groups and say, hey, um, these organisations um, have to replace their pads. Are you interested in supporting them by buying the pads? And so we'll do that. And so they'll, they'll purchase the pads and donate them to the group. So, so we really take responsibility for um, advising and maintaining the devices because the community just aren't familiar enough with them and it takes the pressure off of them. Another good approach, thank you. There's another question, please. What, obviously the hardware is, is one aspect of it. What is being done within your services to ensure that, like calling the emergency services is the first priority, the second thing that comes into that person's mind is to go and find that AED, um, as opposed to having to be told to go and find it? Could we have the other question as well, and then you could just answer, please? 
Oh, hello, uh, Dan from WA. Um, it's a question more for YY, I suppose. And you were talking about uh, perhaps taxi, taxis and, and, and services in the area. And it's just a uh, very quick thought about uh, mental well-being and stuff for those kind of people. Given that particularly perhaps in your demographic, they might be exposed to cardiac arrest maybe a bit more frequently than the average layperson. Okay, first the priority is... <clears throat> Please, any? Yeah, I'll answer, Kurtz. Um, we take a... <laughs> what we try to do here is because it's getting them to realise that the patient is probably dead is our, probably our biggest problem out in the communities. But if you look a wee bit closer to home and into the metropolitan, we run, and it is, it is uh, a different step to this one, but we run a pretty good schools programme. And um, so at the moment we have about... Um, we have about 50% coverage of our school's program for first aid, which includes AEDs and CPR, and we introduce um, kids to the seat to doing pushing and blowing and pushing buttons, basically, from, pre, from kindergarten. Um, so they get to see what an AED looks like. They don't get taught how to use it, but they, so that it's not unfamiliar, and then that is repeated at grade three and grade six um, within uh, over 50% of our schools. So we concentrate on um, getting them to remind their parents rather than r the parents. And that's, it's just a, a simple message. Well, okay. Um, okay, so <clears throat> I'll, I'll try and take the two questions. So first one, how do you get people uh, you know, to you know, automatically think about the AD? It's hard because um, ADs, is, ADs are not often in your stream of conscience and you don't really think about it walking around uh, on a daily basis, right? So, um, one, I mean, the DARE program was something that we did and it's mandatory in all schools as well. And I think really starting at schools is definitely one good idea. Uh, getting kids used to this so that it's natural to them. Um, I'm going to share with you a failed idea uh, that I have. How many of you have done a fire drill in the last 12 months? That's not bad. So, you know, fire department has a lot of traction, right? Mandatory fire drills in Singapore, right? Every building needs to have a, uh, annual fire drills. I think schools, I think twice a year. So, you know, I've been trying to mug the commissioner of fire and, you know, get him to change the law to call it not a fire drill, but an emergency drill. You know, it's not a big thing because you already have to do a fire drill in big buildings, right? Why not turn it into an emergency drill where you talk about, okay, we are, this is the fire drill, you evacuate to this place. And other emergencies, an AED is in this part, this part, and this part of the building. You could even maybe get the you know, uh, EMS agency to do a CPR demo, perhaps. You know? So these may be some things, if you, if you have ability to lobby your legislat uh, legislature, maybe convince them to change the name from a fire drill to an emergency drill. And, you know, it's just a little incremental, maybe another five minutes just to point out where the ADs are. It's just like David uh, this morning telling us about emergency procedures, right? So it doesn't take a lot of time. And, it's, uh, if, and if you're riding or piggybacking on an existing law, that would be a way to, to get to, you know, uh, insert your agenda and get putting this idea of AED in everybody's minds. And this is uh, something that's on a massive scale. Uh, another failed idea that I'd like to share with you too. The, the other question. Yes, too. yes. Um, okay. Another failed idea, we're doing this gamification thing with ADs like Pokemon Go, so to get people check into places and, you know, uh, play as a game. So my university students actually uh, did this as a project. They're publishing it as a little trial, but uh, we, yeah, publishing a game is really, really a lot more complicated than that. But, you know, it's something that you can think about if you have people who are doing hackathons and stuff like that. Mental wellness and AED use for taxi drivers. Okay, so for the My Responder group, we, uh, we started off about four years not knowing what we were doing. And uh, after about a year of doing it, then we, we started also collecting qualitative feedback. So, in fact, informally, my uh, fire officer actually calls uh, people who've responded. So people who have started doing CPR, we know who they are because the app actually knows the person by the phone number. So we actually call them to ask them initially just like, did you do CPR? Did you get an AED? Because we didn't have that information in the early versions of the app. Then we realized that there were mental health issues. So from that, <clears throat> we started uh, asking them if they would like 
a psychologist? Would they like to talk to a para-counselor that would be provided by the fire department? So these guys would just ask them, are you sleeping well, so and so forth. If the person says, no, I'm fine, then uh, we leave it. If they says that, you know, I, I still have uh, nightmares and other things, uh, we've actually uh, assigned them for a follow-up call uh, in the system. So, the, so we've done that during the first and second year. After that, we added in the feedback button. We've also created a Facebook group of responders and we try to bring people who've responded into the Facebook group so they can decompress and talk about their experiences. So it's a closed Facebook group and it's of people who are, are verified, they have signed on to the app. So that way, you know, if uh, someone flags up through the group or someone flags up through the app or through the calls, they indicate they want some help, uh, we're able to help them. Thank you. Uh, time is running. Um, we have Karen. A very short yes and no question. <laughs> to um, the lay responders because uh, we, we did a bit of research that sort of showed that um, if the app hadn't gone off they thought oh it's broken or I haven't downloaded it properly but I feel like it's a perfect opportunity for ambulance services to use this um, mobile technology to send key messages out to the public and use it as a communication vessel. I can take that question, <laughs> but it's not going to be a yes or no. Uh, we, we do that in Copenhagen with our first responder program. First of all, we, have, uh, we send out the SMS for people, then we afterwards ask them for feedback, uh, what they have been doing, if they were there before, came there before the ambulance services arrived, if they did CPI, if they fetched an AED there, and also if they, how they felt, uh, the psychological part of it, and, it, and they are asked to rate themselves on a scale from uh, one to ten, and or five it actually is. And if they rate themselves five, they know that we will call them. Uh, a physician will call them and de debrief them. If they rate themselves four, we will also call them. They don't know that, but we will. Uh, and we have had, and we're following up that on project, and we, we have had no uh, psychological negative impact for, for the many heart rate runners we have, or first responders we have. And then we have a Facebook group for, for these volunteers, and it's amazing what, they, what kind of people they are in that Facebook group. We thought that it would be kind of communication from us. They would ask questions. We would give uh, medical answers. No, they just answer all the questions themselves. They support each other. It's a supportive community they have established. So that kind of feedback is necessary, and we also use that to to ensure them uh, during uh, the period that they're still active uh, and we make changes and they are still want to sign up or want to uh, sign off, uh, they can do as well. So, so I think that is the feedback to the uh, bystander is very important. Uh, we, as you can hear, we have a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, questions and there's also a lot of knowledge here and there's a lot of thoughts, so it's not just yes and no. This is a developing area. It's very important. It's one of the 10 steps uh, using AEDs, but mostly to engage the community and bystander. Uh, we have a lot of challenge, as you have heard. Some of them is the feedback, some of it is, is the funding, uh, but also recruiting first responders and the way we're doing that, linking that to the dispatch center and making sure we have a registry that is fully updated and, and working. Uh, but we sh and also the, we also discussed the issues of private ADs that uh, might be signed up. Uh, we we deliver that information to all the AD providers in Denmark so that they will have the information when they sell it and forward that to the customer. And and we have the National Board of Health uh, encouraging people to sign up for the public AADs uh, network. And it is kind of embarrassing if you haven't done that as a company, a hotel, or uh, public institutions should have an AD and they should have it outside their building and they should be signed up for the national uh, network. So that is a way to go to go nationally through the National Board of Health in, in promoting that. And still we should remember uh, when an AD is used, you save 50 to 70 percent of those with cardiac arrest. But it means you have to be there early and you have to use an AD there. And the earlier you are ready, uh, the more you will have that will be shockable. So that is the important thing. But to do so, you have to have systems like you have described, you have to have people like you have described, and you have to continuously 
uh, develop your system and share it, share your knowledge with others. So let's thank the panel for the discussions and the answers. <laughs>